Let's go, let's go, let's go. The blackout is on and cracking. What's going on? It's ODM. Welcome back to another blackout episode here on the podcast right here. And uh, first and foremost, I'd like for you to share this uh, this episode right here, man, because it's going to be a good one. You already know. Money Moon's in the building. What's good, sir? Shit, what up, bro? Just over here recovering from Vegas last weekend. Bro, super lit, super <laughs> turnt, but... At the same token, we turned that place out. I mean, Hell we played yeah. with, uh, for, for those that don't know, didn't get a catch to the vlog, we uh, performed with Bone Thugs and Harmony. Yeah. Too Short. Ja Rule. Ja Rule. Digital Underground. Ja Rule actually was a replacement for uh, the game. And with last minute, I don't know, for, for some reason, he wasn't able to be part of that bill. So I tried to get the good, the inside, and find out why the hell he wasn't on stage. They, but they want to say nothing? They weren't having that. Nah, man. Damn. But Bone Thugs, uh, for, and also what we found out is Bone Thugs, so it's supposed to be their last show, right? The last tour. The last tour? Yeah, their last tour. Like, this is the last year they're touring, they said. Okay, because I know they got another a gig in L.A. coming yeah. up soon, too, as well. Yeah. But, uh, man, it was so lit. Wifey had a good time. Your girl did. We just yeah. we got super, bur you know, <laughs> burnt out. <laughs> Moon's barely recovering with us Damn. today, man. Been sleeping, man. Fuck. Hey, that's that road life, homie. You know Straight what I'm saying? Up. So, anyway, again, please share the um, podcast right now. Tag somebody. Uh, we try to get these numbers up. You know what I mean? Guest by guest. Um, and we're blessed, man. Let's get into it today. Today's guest is uh the homie you know what i'm saying i always want to bring the homies on I i've known this cat for some time you know he's a dj a legendary dj i want to throw that out there as well he's also got his uh superstar podcast man that he's been doing for a few years now um you might have heard of it it's called rhodium radio uh this guy is legendary in the game with some of the old school acts i mean i don't even like to call it old school timeless acts you know from back in the day i mean the dr dre's of the world you know what i'm saying sir jinx and i you know i can keep going and he's also a film producer as well ladies and gentlemen the homie dj tony a the wizard thank you my brother thank you man it's a blessing to be here brother thank you for the invitation oh I, it's like uh, our third time meeting on a podcast two yes. on yours and uh that was a, a great time as well man and i've learned a lot of stuff man from, from you uh podcasting as well now i've done radio yes for for 20 some years but this is kind of like a, a different breed so to speak absolutely absolutely actually you make me feel like we're on the radio station right now. <laughs> <laughs> see why is it my presence is it the way i direct both all of it is but that it, wrong is no, that bad no that's a good thing that's okay, a, okay because few people have that okay good that's so a, it is a good, good thing. thing well thank you man i appreciate that i mean you know when you've been doing something for so many years that that's all that you're trained to do in your program so to speak because in radio they know how to program your ass and <laughs> you know but i'm just happy that i get to have my own platform i can fucking cuss and do what the fuck Absolutely. i want to do <laughs> you know Absolutely. what i'm saying <laughs> somebody pisses me off i can let you know about it but welcome to the show brother and um when was the last podcast you were on the last podcast that i was on you know what i rarely do too many podcasts because i always right. think to myself like you know what uh my story i don't want to share it too much because it might be overkill right but so many people like constantly ask me would you be on my podcast would be my podcast the last one i believe i did was probably american cholo ah uh, shout out to gail man yeah. that's the homie right there yeah the gail and then a year ago but it just recently came out i was on the hood blogs I was on Hood Blog. I saw that. Yeah, it just came out Saturday. And I thought the guy was never going to bring that shit out. But then he hits me like three days before. And he tells me, hey, bro, it's going to come out on Saturday. I said, all right, cool, man. So You filmed it a while ago? Uh, like like a year ago. No shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and he tells me I usually film these like a year in advance. And I said, yeah. why? And he said, because I go everywhere. He's a guy from Russia. Bro. And he says. Oh, he's from Russia. He's from Russia. I've seen his uh, Snapchats. That's yeah. where I first got turned on to his uh, show, The Hood Vlogs. And yeah, bro, I've seen him in New York. He's in different hoods and yes. barrios, right? Yes. Yeah. So he, uh, I interviewed a guy named uh, Ronan Gray. And Ronin says, man, I like your fucking story, bro. He says, I'm going to bring this guy in. He's a good friend of mine. He's going to be interested in doing your show, you know, uh, interested in doing you, uh, a podcast on you. Yeah. I said, all right, cool, whatever. So one day they just like showed up. I didn't even know they were even coming. Right, and right. They, and they just like, hey, man, this guy wants to film you. And I was like, bro, you should at least told me. Yeah, yeah, Well, he's in town right now. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. And he's got, he's, he's got some subs, man. He's, yeah. he's doing it, bro. Yeah. Ronin is... Is that the cat that uh, he, he's been on the show? Is he from Boyle Heights? Or? Boyle Heights. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I yeah. peeped him out, man. I peeped him out. That's what's up, dude. So 
what's been up? I mean, other than, I mean, I, I've obviously, I've, I've looked you up. I've, I've seen all your material out there, and, and I don't want to sit here with the basic question. Where'd you from? Where'd you? Obviously, you always wear Wilmington, so we know he's from Wilmas, California. That's right. That's right. And what, what was fascinating to me right off top was when you grew up, you grew up um, – selling records like you were hustling like at 12 years old or something like that man i mean when i was 12 bro i mean i was on the baseball field you know mom kept me active because i was like so you know i was 100 miles an hour you know what i'm saying waiting for a ticket but you actually started work at a young age is yes. that is that because well my, i was a you, swamp me baby okay my mom uh they didn't work but she she was a genius at making little girl clothes little girl dresses okay so one of my brothers had an idea it was like why don't we just set up a stand at the swamp meet? this was a swamp meet called the, the vermont swamp meet in the city of gardena okay and so i was 11 years old and i would go and help her so one day my older brother i got four older brothers and five, five brothers and four sisters wow yeah so one of my brothers says, hey, I'm going to go buy some records from this Japanese guy named Steve. Yeah. Go with me. So I walked over there, uh, like two aisles down, and um, he played Wicca Rap. Do you remember that song? Wicca Rap. Wicca, 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 right? No, Wicca Rap was, remember, uh, rest in peace, Coolio, he sampled it. Remember? One, two, three, three four. four. Get, get your bottom on, on the, the floor. floor. Yeah, yep, okay. yep. And it had that dude, like some English guy. Exactly. Singing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I started popping. Okay. And, um. Funny story why I started popping, but Steve, a young guy at the time, Steve Yano, rest in peace, he calls me over and he says, hey, kid, who, you know, what's your name? So my brother says, oh, that's my brother, Tony. Right. And he goes, man, let me see you do some moves. So a crowd came. So he asked me, hey, can you pick up a, a record crate? So I picked it up and he says, uh, you want a job? And I said, doing what? And he says, uh, selling records with me, you know, me and my wife, Susan. And every once in a while, show me some of your moves. Right. Because he wanted the crowd to come in. Right. You know? So I said, all right. So he paid me 20 bucks to uh, set up with them Saturdays and Sundays, pretty, pretty much $10 a day. And all I really used that money for on it was video games. Video games. Of course, man. That's, That's how it. we play. What was your, what was your video game at the time? Star Castle. Ooh. Uh, uh, um, what was it? Um, Asteroids. Definitely asteroids. There you go. Space Invaders. Yeah. And, you know, Donkey Kong. Right, right, right. Those were the favorites for sure. And then uh, Galaga, a couple others that I can remember. Centipede. Remember the track and field? <laughs> When you get the comb out, yes. I used to know all the little tricks, man. You know, especially when I didn't have quarters, you know, you'd bring a, a straw in the back of your back pocket and you, and that's how you're able to get credits, man, until you got yes. popped. Steve Yano, um, wow. So you met him at 12 years old, and I know he's a great big part of your life, great big part of your history. And the reason why you, what you're doing today is because, you know, Steve, and with the whole uh, documentary and the rhodium uh, situation, which is dope. We'll get into that in a little. Um, so you were working with him at a break popping whatnot, but I don't know. Did you stop popping at some point? And did you? Yeah, I did. When did you start DJing? Or well, what happened was this: that uh, this actually, but let me rephrase that. I wasn't twelve. I was actually eleven years old. Okay. And he brought a guy one time, first time that I ever saw a guy on two turntables, and he set him up at the swamp meet at his stand. Mm. And I remember looking, thinking to myself, why does he need two? You know, why right. you've never seen this is all brand new to you, all brand new to yeah. me. And then he had, you know, back then the faders were just up and down, okay, up and down. Do you remember so, the mixer? No, I don't remember. Okay. I, okay. I don't, but I, I remember I kept looking at him. And so I learned just by looking. So I'd ask him, why does this one go up when the needle's over here? Oh, that's the volume. And then I was like, okay, so it only makes sense that when this one is up, right. You know, so you were learning. Yes. Pretty much around that time. That's when I didn't care about popping. I wanted to learn this. Mm. I, and then I was fascinated when I saw um, Grandmaster Flash, a commercial, uh, um, where he was cutting and scratching. Fat Five Freddy was right there. Uh, and I was like, wow, that, that's amazing. Yeah. Because I saw him do this. And I thought that was like rocket science, bro. Like, yeah. Like, fuck breaking and popping. Yeah. It's all about this. Did you ever think that, oh, my God, you, like, this dude's going to break the record? Because, you know... It's almost like taking the needle and going across the record yes, with it. Yes. Like, did you ever? Think, well, well, but damn, dude! Yeah, like, like I'm thinking, like, why isn't the needle falling off, or why is it staying on? But I noticed he had like a coin, like it was a nickel. Or a I always wonder why DJs put coins on on their needles. Because we had belt drive turntables. We didn't have twelve hundreds back then. Okay. So a lot of times, I think learning how to scratch on those belt drives, you had to, you had to have some type of skill because if you're heavy handed, 
you you have to know how to dub, 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 and then push the record on time because those turntables, if you let them go, they'll go. Rrr. The techniques or the old school the ones? The old school got ones. Got it, got the it. The old school ones because they were belt driving. They were fucked up. But uh, Grandmaster Flash had a belt drive turntable, so I would see the way he would do it and then push the record. Mm. Now, when you get on Techniques 1200, obviously that's the Rolls Royce of turntable. Right, right. You know, but uh, um, the first time I actually saw somebody scratch in person now was a guy named King Tim. I was uh, maybe 14 years old at the time, mm. and I went to a VIP Records in the city of Long Beach. Hey. Uh, um, drive up PCH from Wilmington all the way to Long Beach, maybe just a couple, 15 minutes. The owner, Calvin Anderson, I became good friends with him, but I saw a guy scratching, and I was like, what the fuck? Now I've seen it in person. Right. Saw a guy blend, saw a guy on TV, now I'm actually seeing it in person. Yeah. So now I'm like, I'm in. I'm in. And it's kind of like when you see a car or you test drive a car, the next day you see those cars everywhere. Yes. Like you're seeing DJing from every different angle at this point. Yes, yes. So I knew at that point that's what I wanted to do. So mm. I went out and got a job that I didn't want. And if I were to say kids, so they wouldn't even know what that is. Paper route. Right. <laughs> you know, I went in and got a paper route job. And then I started asking people, do you know anybody that wants to sell turntable. I didn't know what kind of turntable I was looking for. Yeah. But I remember I had a guy that was a friend of mine in junior high. He was a spoiled kid. I think we all had friends that just got everything that they yeah. asked their mom for. Okay, cool. If you have that mom, that's dope. I didn't like his ass. Yeah, okay? yeah, I'll yeah. be honest. I didn't like it, but I found out that he had turntables at his house. So I befriended him. And I said, hey, man, I, I, um, his name was Paul. Yeah. I, I heard that you had turntables. I said, yeah, man, yeah. You, you want to come to my house? Yeah, okay. I, <laughs> so what I did, I went to his house. He showed me his turntables, and he had Technique 1200s. No, brand new. Brand new, no bro. And I, and I was like, holy shit. Yeah. So then I said, hey, man, can I practice on here? And he said, yeah. So now I'm going to practice what I've seen people do. Was this kid active at all on these tables, or was it just he got it as a gift, and he just kind of played with it for a week? That's exactly what it was. Oh, that's shit. That's exactly what it was. So what I did... I told him, look, bro, and I went in my pocket, and I go, I got five bucks. I'm going to give them to you. And he said, for what? And I go, I want you to get out of the room. <laughs> he kicked him out of the Yes. <laughs> yes, bro. So that's where I Were started. you nervous? Is that why? Yes. And I, I didn't know what the hell I was doing, but that's what I wanted to do. Yeah. That's what I wanted to do. So my first DJing gig was this. I go to, I'm going to Wilmington Junior High School. They start putting up flyers. They want to give the students an opportunity to, uh, uh, to, to DJ. Who wants to DJ the school noon dances? Mm. If you have any type of experience, come talk to the dean. Right. So the dean put up all these flyers. So when I saw that, I'm not going to lie to you. I went late to my class because I took down all the flyers. I didn't want nobody to sign up. So I went to the dean. I said, I'm a DJ. Wow. Mm. Look at him. He's doing shit. I don't know, Tony, if I, that, that sits right with me already. But you had to do what you got to do, man. You know what I'm saying? Who knows what have, like, battled you that day? You know what I mean? Uh, had they got their chance. Yeah, maybe. You know what? So, But what I did, he goes, you're a DJ? He goes, let me show you my equipment. He had one cassette deck, a mixer with a round fader, and a uh, uh, one turntable, bell drive turntable. Okay. So I'm already thinking, okay, um, the hottest song out right now is Do It by the Barcase. It just dropped. Yeah. I'm going to put that. I'm going to bring it on vinyl, but I'm also going to put it on cassette. I'll play it on cassette, and then I'll just kind of like throw this one on and turn the, the, the volume and then put my headphones on to this cassette, line up the next song. I literally DJ. So whose equipment was this? The school's. So you're using theirs, which yes. was cheap shit, obviously. Yes. Wasn't your boy's techniques. And I'm just like fascinated because... He's explaining to you how he's mixing off a cassette and one belt drive turntable. Yes. And making it work. Go on. So that was it, man. So I knew that if I screwed up, everybody, everybody was going to laugh at me because I wasn't a popular kid. Like I, I wasn't. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you why I wasn't. Because during that time, I want people to understand that if you were Mexican, okay, uh, if you were just Latino, I don't care if you were from Guatemala, Honduras, or, or from El Salvador, if you spoke Spanish around certain kids, you would look that little different. Mm. You know, I remember one, I was hanging around with these, with a group of guys that uh, um, wouldn't call themselves Mexicans. Oh, I was born in Hawaii and I was born in Fresno and I was born over anything but Mexico. Yeah. So one day they heard me talk Spanish and one guy looked at me and told me, I knew you were a wetback. Oh shit. No, I'm serious. I live, you know, a lot of us live with that. So 
I knew like, okay, I'm already known as a tall, goofy wetback. So if I screw this up, yeah, I'm done. Right, right, right. But I'll tell you what, after that day, everything changed. I was somewhat like the popular kid. You got your props. Yes. From yes. all races, all cultures. Yes, yes. Was it a predominantly, was it black, Mexican school? Uh, it, it, it was everything. Mixed. Samoans, Filipinos, whites, yeah. uh, uh, blacks. That's kind of how I grew up too. Yeah. It was just that the, the neighborhood and you had everybody was... And that's the thing I keep feeding these days, man. Like, we were all from the same neighborhood, man. Yes. You know, my, my, my next-door neighbor was black. He was my best friend. My The guy in front of me across the street was white. He was my best friend. They were both named Sean. And it was right. like, and then I had my homie, my, my Mexican homie Ralphie down, and then Alex down the street. But we all grew up in the same neighborhood. And I liked it like that better. Yeah. I liked it like that better, you know. I mean, I didn't see nothing wrong with it. But So who was calling you names? Who was calling you wetback? My own people. No shit. Oh, I'm dead serious. P people out there, when they watch this, Rasa, if you're watching, many of you have gone through the same thing that we've gone through. And it was always the people that wanted to act, Chicanos that wanted to act white. Okay. Why that is, I don't know. Well, I'll explain some. I know when I grew up in Santana, that's where I was. Uh, went to school at. And my mom, it started with my mother. She would come home and, and, and there was a lot of, and this is a big reason why I'm not heavily fluent in Espanol. It's because she would talk mainly English to me. Mm -hmm. And this is a true story. And a lot of the pochos can, can, you know, attest to this. She was taught to not speak Spanish in in the uh, at her workplace mm. when she went to work it was english only and i'm right. sure it was the same as it was in school it, it is uh, in the workplace as well until maybe 20 years later when she right. started flipping around and they realized we started doing she started doing business with mexico brazil and chile and like all these different places. then they needed her right then it just kind of flipped it, it, right right do you agree absolutely and, and here's the crazy part because a lot of these kids were really 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 popular yeah okay but a lot of these guys, I mean, like, one thing we had in common was that I had a record collection, I was a DJ, and I knew how to pop. A lot of these guys probably weren't talented like that, so they figured, let me hang out and learn from this guy. That was right. really the only thing why they talked to me. But be besides that, they were the popular kids. I was the wet bag. They yeah. hang out with me outside of school, whatever. But then they get out of high school. They're no longer popular no more. You know what they want to do? They want to join a gang now. Yeah, it was, it, was, it was active during that time as yeah. well. So, so your, your brother, though... Um, you had a brother that DJ, didn't you? Yes, my, the brother above me. I was just on the phone with him a little while ago. Yeah, yeah. He's the one that introduced me to uh, pretty much funk and R and B because we didn't have rap yet. You know, at least not a lot of it. What was his DJ name? Just oh, Maniac Mario. Maniac Mario. Shout out to Maniac yeah. Mario. Yeah, it, you know it was crazy because back then DJs had names like today you know i'm tony a okay or right. tony a, the wizard or the turntable wizard yeah I i'll explain how i got those but me every dj back then i remember there was a guy his name was radar yeah another guy his name was bumpers like they had names like that sure you know and i never understood why it was different right and it was cool remember uh uh k rock they had richard blade i don't think he had yeah. a, another name but then there was the poor man right 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 okay. remember the poor man yeah so they all had like different names i think nicknames today, yeah nicknames i yeah. guess you know which was which was dope i think today uh, um are dj still popular today bro i mean some i i would say so i mean i look at more of the timeless ones you know yeah. what i mean yeah um but I, I couldn't tell you like other than people uh, like djs that are you know that are making records right, <laughs> you know, right, dj right. Khaled. you know what i'm saying uh right funk flags i mean he's always a yeah. legend but they're yeah. legends i, I yeah. can't think of any newer Kate ones Capri. don't come for me you know what i'm saying but right. that's just the era i grew up in I, I think the popular ones right now at least from what my son tells me are the ones that are doing i don't even know if i'm even saying it right the raves or the edc was it edm okay know? yeah 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 the, the, the house djs um or even just i don't know man it, it's a different character because when i start seeing people like DJs that were known, and this started maybe six, seven years ago, maybe even a little longer. And the house DJs, like, I don't know if David Guetta necessarily did it, you know, when, when that was huge. But a lot of these cats, I don't know if you've seen them perform in concert, and a lot of them were getting exposed because they were playing pre-mixes. Yes. And they weren't even physically DJing. Right. When I saw that, I was like, oh, shit, dude. I let the cat out the back. I'm like, man, nothing's real. Technology is taking over. Te technology is taking over. I like that quote. It says, uh, thank God that I had a childhood before technology took over. Absolutely, dude. And, and I ain't mad at, you know, Serato. I mean, that actually, I ain't got to carry 20 crates. And there's other DJs nowadays that, right. oh, man, I just keep it OG. It's not. Okay, that's fine. You do that. You got a squad to help you lift crates. 
more cool. power to you, you yes. know. And, and and I love those unique nights though that clubs throw. You know, sometimes they'll yes. have an event strictly vinyl. That's dope because that's special. You know, it is very special. And it educates the youth, youth, lets them know where it came from. Yes, yes, yeah. So that's pretty much my story uh, as far as junior high. Yeah. When I got to high school, it got a little bit more competitive. Uh, you remember that record? There was a DJ group called Knights of the Turntables. Sounds familiar. Okay, well, they went to my high school. Uh, Boogaloo Shrimp, yep. Mike, Michael Chambers, Turbo. What yeah. up, Mike? Yep. Yeah, he, he went to my high school. A lot of people came out of my high school, and it was so diverse. Again, it was black, Filipino, Samoan, white, Mexican, everything. That's why our banning football team was great, great during the 80s. Hmm. And, and they always had these classic matches against Bannon and Carson, Bannon and Carson. Rivals? Year, rivals, big okay. time rivals. And it, it, a lot of those games were determined by like one point. Okay. You know, so th those were good games, great times. Then you look at the, all the '80s, the damn crack epidemic hits. Yeah. Then gang violence is at all time high. Yep. True. Probably to me the best era of music. Mm -hmm. Late '90s, '87, '88, gangster rap is introduced to the world. Yeah. So I always say that if I survive that, I could survive this uh, COVID epidemic. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, man, those were the golden years right there of music, 80s and 90s. And I'm sure our parents obviously can disagree with that because they grew up in the 60s, which is also great, and 50s and so forth. But, I mean, it, you had funk. You named it. Yeah. R&B. You had the start of uh, West Coast hip hop because yeah. East Coast was already popping in the 80s yeah. or even late 70s yes. with Run DMC and Grandmaster Flash and them. But when it came over here to the West, it just let me know, wow, like NWA dropped. And I was like, this is dope. I remember uh, seventh grade, eighth grade when Dope Man dropped, you know, and I was like, shit. And then it had a fat girl and, and LA is the place. LA is the place. And I was like, wow. Fast forwarding, since we're getting into that group of uh, that genre there, uh, me being an eighth grader, seventh grader, hearing this music, I used to have a homeboy. Shout outs to uh, Javier, dude. He was an older Vato, and like he would take me cruise in. I was a little youngster, and in his car, and his Impala, and we'd go cruise, whatever. Hit the Strawberry Festival here or there locally, but he would always go to the L.A. to go get his tapes. Mm. And I'm I'm pretty damn sure. Were there other places that sold those rhodium mixtapes? Other yes. than was there like the Compton sell them too? The Compton but, in San Diego as well. Because Steve, one thing that I didn't know, not that it mattered, but he was pretty much like a distributor. He would make tapes and then sell them to other stands. Say you were at the Santa Fe Springs or the Paramount Swamp Meets, right? And then I would call you up. Hey, I got the new mixtape. Okay, I need like thirty of them. Yeah. So he would box them and send them. Was he the one physically labeling yes. them? No shit. Yes. 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 <laughs> That's crazy. Yes. Who would have thought, man, that yeah. I would meet the guy? Well, I, you know, I've met him later on in, in, as we came out in the 90s, but that, that was doing that. And I remember my, my homie going back, he had the box of all those tapes, and I just remember sitting on them because I was too small to sit in the car. So right, I'd right. sit on top of the box tapes, and he'd always go every weekend, load up on the new ones. And I remember some of them like, uh, vividly dj battle cat had some he did a lot of mixes on those didn't he no battle cat what the only ones who did them were just me uh well dre did them from 84 to 87 and then i did them from 87 to 91 you took over dre's mixing right yes, yes. facts if y'all don't know about that it's been out there but we're gonna say it again because dre was the first uh mixtape dj quote unquote at the rhodium correct correct and right. then you came in yes. and then I just kind of took over. He asked you to take over, right? Yes, yes. He passed that torch to me. And how, 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 it all, how I met him, it was just so, let me just say this. I was just so blessed and fortunate to have known Steve as a friend because, because of him is how I met everyone. Is how I met ev everyone. Like right. the first time that I met you was in Arizona. We were doing, doing a Johnny Lozoya car show. Mm -hmm. He drove me and High C over there. And then that's how I met you and Bobby. Rest in peace. Steve did. Yeah, Steve did. So he drove us to Frisco, drove us to Oakland. He, he drove us to Texas. Right. You know, he did the same thing for a proper dose, Frank V and Ernie G. And, uh, uh, but he saw, one thing, not to get off track, but he saw the future in Raza in this game. Mm. And that's why he signed proper dose like in 1992 or 93. So that was on Scanless, correct? Yes. How did the name Scanless come about? Um, we used to name our tapes whatever was popping at the time so let's just well, i had a tape called bullshit and we used to <laughs> always call each other like man you're bullshitting bro so steve not being necessarily from before hood, sugar free yes before biggie party and bullshit right <laughs> he just said let's name that tape that bullshit yeah all right cool one day uh, uh and again 
I was slanging some some let's just say so I was curb serving some pebbles. Okay, okay got you. They and, all start somewhere. Yeah, so so I got a I got a, a I want to say a beat, but this generation probably well, I had a pager, and a guy wanted a twenty. So I was right in the middle of a mixtape, and I told Steve, hey, I'm going to go to the alley, but right back. So I went in my closet, got my little bag of kibbles and bits, mm. and I uh, went back there, and he saw me with a little, a little, um, little, a little, a band, I guess people call it today. Okay. Uh, uh, of money. A okay, of money. got you, yeah. So uh, he, I walked, he walked back in, and I placed it, and he goes, how much is there? And I go, well, that's recop money. And he said, what's recop money? I said, well, that's the money I got to buy some more with. That's not my spending money. Mm. Uh, I, I first make my money back. And then I go buy some more and whatever's left over, that's profit. Smart, yeah. So, and he was like, oh, okay. So he named that mixtape Recop. So that was- <laughs> Recop. So whatever- I like that. Yeah, so whatever was popping at the time, like scandalous, high seas though, we say, man, that's some scandalous shit. Right, that was yeah. the word back then. Right, so- and, and matter of fact, the playlists were called scandalists. Yes, yes. I caught that, that's dope. Yeah, so, uh, so we named one tape- Scan list and it was spelled S K A N L I S T, scan list. So when we wanted to name our album, we said, "Bro, scan list doesn't sound right. Let's say scan list." So we just changed it to L E S S at the end. Crazy. Yeah. Now I see you. He was working there at the swap meet as well, right? Rhodium and um, had you met him? Like, like, how long were you there before you met I see there? I met. Hi, C. Late '88. I was there already in '87, and the reason why Jure had asked me to take over doing the mixtapes because he had already seen me spin. Well, he had already seen me DJ. Because I don't know if these kids today know what spin means. Right, right. So, so I used to go to his house in South Central when he used to live with Sir Jinx. Jinx was just a teenager, so Jinx always wanted Jure to get in the room and battle me. And he goes, I, I want you to fuck it up, bro. Yeah. And I'm gonna call Dre in right now. And Jinx gonna, was telling you that. Yeah. Okay. He goes, I'm gonna tell my uncle, well, my cousin, whatever. Let's uh, um, get on the turntables. So I was mixing uh, Dr. Dre in surgery on purpose. Ooh, Dr. Yeah. So so um, he came in and he looked at me and I said, um, and I said it humbly because to me, Dr. Dre is a fucking turntable god at least for me at right. the time. You know. Sure. So I said, you want, you want to get on? He says, Now nah, you got me, man. He said, I ain't, I ain't clean like that. So he said, hey, listen, uh, we're about to finish up this record. And we're going to start a tour. Wait, wait, wait. So y'all never battled? No, he never. He didn't want to. But get he on. forfeited and said, you he, got me. Dr. Dre forfeited. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Tony A with the win over Dr. Dre. Yeah, so, uh, and Jinx was there. It was just us three. So that's why when I saw him cutting up It's Time on Straight Outta Compton, yeah. I was like, bro, you didn't do that when I was there. You know, so. Hmm. Pause right there. So I know that it was said, I, I interviewed the Egyptian lover one day, and, uh -huh. and it, who used to throw the fucking parties back then? Was the Egyptian? Who had the bomb party? Was the Egyptian lover or Dr. Dre? Because I heard wherever they were at, that shit was hot. Egypt, obviously, he was like, no, nah, my shit was always the fire. Who, who had the dopest party? Okay, it all depends on who you ask, but you're asking me, because I even interviewed yeah. Lonzo twice, okay? Lonzo was Eve After Dark and then Doodles, and those were club parties. They were popping, but I was an Egyptian lover, had the bigger events. They were running stadiums already. Right. You know, so I would say when it came to more people, bigger events, Egyptian lover. Okay. When it came to DJ cutting and scratching, it, it's Dre and them. Dre and them. Dre, Yella, and uh, 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 even um, so, so, so Egyptian lover through the events made it a show. Uncle Jam's army. And, yes. and, and Dre was just known for the battle, bat, baddest yes. DJ skills, whatnot. Yes. I remember watching Egyptian lovers, my very first concert ever. I don't think Dre was there, but uh, there's a there's a video going around if you search it in Santa Ana Bowl, mm. and it was right next to the jail there. Egyptian lover was headlining. And Arabian Prince was there. I remember Arabian Prince came into the uh, uh, into the stands. He was shaking hands. I was like, oh, mesmerized. I was like a little 12-year-old. Hey, dude, want to bite my taco? Like, I was like, I swear to God. I was a, and I just told him this story like a couple weeks ago, too. And, we're, you know, I walk, he's going to come on the podcast. But it was just, it was a dope moment for me as a kid, man. You know, as I, I'm sure it was with you working with all these greats. Absolutely. And, and keep in mind, a lot of people always ask me, man, how was it working with Q? How was, how was it having easy at your house? And you didn't even know who some of these cats were at the time, right? That's my point. I didn't know who they were. Yeah. I, I didn't know who they were going to become. Right. But I will say this, that they were always about their business. They were always, Dre, one thing I will say, as many times as I saw him at, at Sir Jinx's house, I never saw him there just chilling, drinking a 40, watching TV. 
He always had people over. People were always talking music with him. Mm. He was always on the phone, but he was always doing something productive. Right. Always. So that's one thing that I learned from him. And I learned a lot of quotes, a lot of Dr. Dre quotes. One thing that he would always say is timing is everything, man. You don't want to release your record if it's not time. Mm -hmm. You know, today people say, I did a song today. Let's release it tomorrow. Right. He said, no, you want to, you want to create something that's going to be timeless. Yep. You know? So, I mean, in one year. He did Easy E, the uh, the the first album. He did um, uh, Straight Outta Compton, the MWA album, Michelle, the DOC, JJ Fad, and Above the Law. Okay, mm. he did all of those records. Yeah. Okay, like within maybe a year, year and a half. But those were all planned out, as you as you said. Yes, those were all planned out. Okay, now the last conversation that I had with him was when he had dropped the first Chronic album. Mm. And I asked, just asked him one question, how long did it take you to complete that record, you know? And he said, about a year. Now that blew my mind because back then he was knocking out albums in a matter of weeks. Mm -hmm. I said, so why did it take a year? Because back then, you know, he was like, well, I had to make sure that this was a hit, not a miss. He goes, I had to make sure. Which which record was the, it? The first Chronic album. Oh, shit. And look where, <laughs> look where it is, man. Probably one of the top selling yeah. hip hop albums of all time. Yeah. And I, so I learned a lot of, a lot of things like that, you know? Right. But uh, uh, like for an example, one day he has a, he has a drum machine, the SP 1200 mm. and he's, he's putting in the floppy disc and I noticed he would always put it in his back pocket, a floppy disc. Yeah. Well, you sit down, that's just yeah, going to break. Yeah, it's going to break. Yeah. So I just asked him, I said, Hey, you know what? Um, Where do you keep your, your floppy collection? Because I had one little. One little thing that you open, in, a little floppy disk. Yeah, 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 the little case. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then he goes, oh, uh, uh, just this one. And I said, no, no, but, okay, I know right now you're working <laughs> on, like, he was working 100 miles and running. Okay. And then uh, I said, I know, no, but, like, the Easy e stuff, the NWA, he goes, no, I just use this one. Oh, shit. And I said. It was like a jump drive in the, in the back of his yes, pocket. Yes, yes. But on a floppy disk. So, I said, but what about all your kicks and snares? Like, he goes, no, I just resample them. He said, I, I don't have a collection. He goes, I just use the same one. I just erase everything and start over. Oh, he's doing double the works. I yeah, mean. yeah. And I was like, what the fuck? Like, but a lot of stuff that he did, like on Dope Man. Yeah. Remember, remember when he sampled Funky Drummer? Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, Funky Drummer. Funky and, Worm? Uh, funky Worm. Yeah. I go, that, that was a four bar loop. Did you loop that? He goes, I just rode that motherfucker. I told Donovan, go ahead and press record it. And I rode it. Yo. These are Dr. Dre jams, yo. You don't even understand Tony's giving us right now, man. This is shit you can't even see in a documentary, or can you? No, no, you can't. <laughs> you can't. Dude, that is dope. Dre breaking down on how he sampled the Funky Worm. If you were around that time, you know, you know. If you know the song, Dope Man, you know, you know. And this is dope, bro. Keep going, man. Wait, yeah. I got a question. Yes, yes, sir. Easy E. Okay, I remember... Uh, they would rap at the rhodium. They would on the on the mixtapes, right? right? And it was said that Easy wasn't the greatest rapper, and you know Dre just uh, even when you watch the movie Straight Outta Compton, you know he he puts him in the booth and he does line by line. That part's true. Very very true. So when he rapped on the mixtapes, was that before Boys in the Hood or was that after? Because it sure sounded like he, he knew what he was doing. After. And I'm going to tell you something that a lot of people do not know. Easy would always say that he's not a rapper. He would always say that I'm not a rapper. I'm not a rapper. This was all Dre's idea. Right. What a lot of people don't know, that even if you can rap, Dre's going to have you do it over and over and over and over again. He's a perfectionist. That's just the way it is. So a lot of people, they like to point that out about Easy. Yeah, it is true. Easy was not a rapper and his delivery wasn't there. Dre was trying to get that out there. So he had to work a little extra harder than the ordinary rapper. Right. For an example, Nocturnal, it was just, uh, I just did a podcast with him. Okay. And he told me that he did a verse, like his chorus, maybe like 150 times. And I said, why? He said, Dre said, I'm not hearing it. You see that, Vatos? Richie Valens ain't the only one redoing his shit in the movie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, Easy e would come over, he would get, get a, a record crate, stand it up, sit down on it, yeah. he'd get a pen, and he'll write. He wrote, okay, go ahead, give me the mic. Get busy with Easy and Tony A on the 12 technique, see? It's a steal, and Steve is promoting them. Dope bad shit by the wizard at the rhodium. That's it. Yo, fuck it up, Tony. And, and that was it. Was bro. he a one take Jake or did he did it take him maybe, a while? Maybe three times. Yeah. But Steve just wanted to do a Dr. Dre. Can we get one more? Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Now, Steve Yano, 
where did Susan play a role in in, in your career or, or you know because I don't hear too much about her well you know what uh, I what his is, wife yes well, what is that quote behind a, a strong man is a strong woman uh, right okay right um she what is well rest in peace Steve the love of his life bro mm. like, and they did everything together people actually thought that they were actually at least from my end they were brother and sister okay but they were always always together bro hustling yes he would make decisions and she would pretty much take care of the finances because i think you got to give credit where credit is due especially the women as you say yes you know i've been married and i know my wife holds down a lot of shit and sometimes i can't think of everything and, and there's right. always your, your partner who's there right. i got you yes and i think i, I commend uh, susan and she she's susan still, she's, she's still alive, still alive. Yes. And, yeah. you know and for, for doing that as well for standing yeah. by steve so there were times like i would call steve and i was like steve you know man i want to get paid you know because hollywood gave us a forty thousand dollar advance and then after the album was done they get they give us the whole other hundred yeah so he would always tell me you know call up susan and she'll write you a check okay cool but she would take care of me. Tony, I'm going to take you to a Japanese bank out here in the city of Alhambra. Okay, cool. I'm going to do your taxes. I'm going to write off this off. We're going to do this. Up. And I hardly ever paid any tax because they took care of me. Right. Like, so Susan did a lot of the things, a lot of, if you will, the paperwork, a yeah. lot of the, the business side. Steve was more of like, okay, we're going to do this song. Maybe you should sample that. Maybe you should get this guy on this track. Yeah. He was more of that. She had the more of the business side. Let me ask you, did you ever run into any issues with them financially? No, no. Or maybe, maybe question something? You know what? I don't want to throw him under the bus. Well, but, but. I mean, I don't mean to bring that up, but it's business and it does happen. Right. And, and the reason why I say that, because right. a lot of us, a lot of majority of artists have experienced that at one right. time. Well, it never came from me. And I'm not going to point fingers, but there was an artist that he had signed that was saying Steve was doing me dirty. Okay. So I said this, because I stood up for him. Right. Here was our deal. A manager usually gets 20%, correct? Right. Okay. Steve wasn't getting 20% from us, okay? He was getting one third. Okay, now. But now here, here's the kicker, okay? Me and High C, we already knew that. Mm. We knew going in that he was getting one third. So it was presented up front. Yes. Okay. But you know what Steve did that nobody saw coming with that money he opened up the Scanlon Studio in Alhambra. Mm -hmm. I remember that. I've and, been there a few times. And you know what? Me and High C had access to record for free whenever we want. And you know what? I was just going to say, he provided, and he probably sounds like that he went um, over and beyond. He did. Then that one third could ever pay. Exactly. Okay, there you go. Shout out. That, that, I just wanted to clear the air because, you know, a lot of us, like I said, have, have been down that route and I don't want to bring up my situation, but, but, no, but that, you know that's what? good. I wanted to clear that. For me, for me, it, it wasn't a problem, especially when we got our, uh, um, our bonus. We got an $85,000 bonus and a trip to anywhere in the world we wanted to go because we were signed to Disney. Yeah. And he didn't get any of that and he didn't have an issue with that. Were you guys the first... I don't want to call I see a gangster rapper, but I mean, hanging coming from Quick and the neighborhood right. in Compton and whatnot to be on Disney. Yeah, <laughs> you go like wow, like you think like, all these like princess movies right. and shit. If you want to call it, I guess the first <laughs> black and Chicano artist signed to Disney. Hey, because if you look at it, and maybe you could help me out with this, Rob. When we look at our album cover, you have a Chicano and you have a, a black guy, or right? A black man. Okay. Um, before that, was there ever anybody else? That was a, a black and Chicano? Not to my knowledge, other than... What's Homeboy's name? Crazy D on the NWA cover? Right. The Dope Man cover? Uh -huh. But the whole posse was there? Right. You know? Okay, now I'm going to throw something out there that I, I said on a, on a Gil from American Cholo Podcast. I'm waiting for it. Okay. <laughs> because for so long, everybody kept telling me, you know what, why don't you get Crazy D, the, the only Chicano, the only Mexican... On the NWA, the yeah. only Mexican this, the only Mexican that. So yeah. one day, me and Crazy D are having a conversation, and he tells me what he really is. Okay? And it blew my mind, man. I'm like, bro, this whole fucking time, you've been, you've been wearing this whole Chicano badge and shit, and everybody thinks you're this and this and that. Yeah. So, so one day, uh, somebody told, uh, I asked Crazy D, would you be in my documentary honoring Steve? Cause he knew Cheers, bro. We didn't, we didn't even do this beginning. It's all good. How Cheers, rude of me. Salut. All right. So I asked him, would you be in my documentary to honor Steve? Because he, he knew Steve. 
And he flat out told me, no, I, I want $2,500. Nobody was charging me, bro. Mm. From Violet Brown to Alonzo to Mr. Cartoon to Warren G. Nobody was charging me. Right. He wanted $2,500. So I forgave And the him. dude ain't got a record out. Nothing. So about a year later, I started my podcast. And I said, hey, man, I'm, I'm reaching out in case you want to come on your pod, my podcast and tell your story. Right. Nah, man. Nah, I, I'm, it's all about money. You got two Gs? Yeah. Fuck it then. I Homeboy didn't. must have been hurting, bro. I mean, I get it. We've all been there. Right. So uh, on American Cholo, right before I went on, somebody kept uh, blowing me up. When are you going to get a real Mexican from NWA? Blah, blah, blah. And I said, first and foremost, he ain't even Mexican, homie. <laughs> He's Italian and Irish. Oh, okay? wow. So there it is there. But so, he was brought up in the in the hood. Yeah. You know, so uh, I, I, it was funny because um, Gil says, so he was a white guy. And I was like, wasn't he the dude that was, uh, yo, Mr. Dome, yeah. you think you're slick? That's him. And we always thought he was Mexican from, from, from this point. You Everybody. Because he he's even says it, right? Y'all yeah. Mexicans always come with this exactly. shit. Exactly. Exactly. You so, know what? And I confronted Easy E about that, about that line. Did you? Hell yeah, I did. No way. Yes, bro. Back then. Back then. Obviously. And But you know what? Easy always have love for Rasa, and his, his answer was something that I wasn't expecting. He said, well, I just said what I saw growing up. He right. goes, and in Compton, a lot of Mexicans bought crack off of me. Okay? That was a pretty bold statement. Yeah, it was. Even I, as 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 young as I was, I was like, man, he, he really said that. Yeah, remember? Because a Mexican almost wrecked my shit. That He's, too. He said that too, okay? So, and then he goes, but at the very end, I'll let you guys, you know, take it back on us by putting in your cool little 38 slug. And I was like, I kind of get it. Facts. And you know what I will say, to come to Easy's defense too, and that is so smart, and that's dope that he explained it to you. But the, the dopest thing was, Easy E was the only, or I'm not going to say only, at that time, first ever black label owner to want to sign Mexican. That's right. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. Easy motherfucking E. Yeah. Rest in peace. Because there's a lot of other cats that would that wouldn't, and because there's there's politics involved yeah. too. So. Yeah. So, anyways, uh, as far as um. Uh, these concerned so that's pretty much what happened but it's funny because when i first saw him on the cover and not to disrespect him i thought he was a white guy yeah come to find out he is right so so yeah. well i'll uh, going back to your then you, to answer your question now i i don't recall anybody from this area at that time right. i know there might be maybe some bay area um i want to say total devastation they had that song, I Smoked Two Blunts, and I smoked, and I want to say they had a black and Mexican um, in their group, but I don't know if it was in their cover. Right, right. But and don't I, quote me. I know people were saying South Central Cartel had a Mexican dude in the cover, but that was like, I believe, like 94 or 95. But from L.A.? Nah. Yeah. You yeah. guys were the first. Yeah, and, and it was funny because Steve loved the idea. Some people at the record label were a little leery on that. They just wanted high C. You know, but I said this, and we had a meeting. I still remember our A and R lady named Rachel Matthews. So if you're watching, I'm saying it. She said, "Well, it'll look better," and I said, "No, I'm just let's just be honest. You're just saying because he, it'll look better because blacks are being more accepted than a Mexican is on the cover." And I told her to excuse the white woman, especially hip hop, right? Yeah. And I said, "But I want to go against the grain. I don't care." I said, "Look, I was doing mixtapes with Easy and those guys." And I found High C, right? You know, and I put them on my mixtapes. Right, right. I you own know, that, right? Yeah. I produced this record. Yeah. You know, I did everything, and then now you want to boot me out? Right. You know, I said, no. Nah. Good. I was, I'm glad you stood up for yourself. You know, and, and put it this way: even in the videos, they were against me being being in the, our first video. I'm not your puppet. Are you shit? No, me? I'm dead serious. I'm dead serious. So you know what I did on purpose? I called my entire fucking neighborhood. All 25 of us showed up. You're getting us in. Yeah. So they got us in a little cameo. I saw him. spots. I saw him, you and Quick. You're walking with Quick, right? That's in right. the video. Yeah. That's yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. So, but that's what I did, bro. I, it, I think that it it, it definitely um, it it shined light on on Latinos and hip. Even though you weren't a rapper, but right. you were the producer slash DJ. You were, and I honestly thought you were part of the crew. But I knew I found out right away once I heard the track because it was an oldie track. Right. We had our Sunday afternoon, which was an oldie track, and it was right around that time, right after Knocking Boots. You know right. that whole era. I was like, dude, this is dope. And, and I think we dropped right at the same time. I just think it, it just brought awareness of, of of spreading the culture, the cultura. You know, like Mexicans 
are are are, are finally getting their their shine right now. And that was just the start of the wave yes. of us being seen and being you know being out right. there in, in hip hop. Right. You know, but I do want to say in Crawford's defense, when I say Crawford, I'm talking about High C. He he wasn't like the record label. He he was like, if we did it, it's us. You know, like like he was for me. He, right. He wasn't a he wasn't against me being there. Right. So we had a guy. We had got a guy named Ian Fletcher. I don't know if he ever did anything for you guys. He was a white dude from Australia. Ah. He came down filming "I'm Not Your Puppet" video, which was a piece of garbage. That shit looked like an old Godzilla movie. <laughs> I was gonna yeah. say, bro. That shit was. Garbage, I was gonna ask bro. you the budget. Do you remember the budget? Twenty five thousand. Twenty five thousand. Twenty five thousand for that video. And that's what you got. Well, back then, a camera, camera, all the rental shit and travel and all that yeah. was more expensive. So I had asked them, "Are you guys gonna use a steady cam?" Because I, I learned a little bit about it, and they were like, "Oh, it's gonna be more money." And I was like, this motherfucker. When I knew that this was going to be a cheap-ass video, this, it was hot as hell. Yeah. He was wearing leather pants. He bends over and he's got no drawers on. He was on some Jim Morrison shit, Ian bro. Fletcher? Ian Fletcher, yes. <laughs> so, so, yes. I'm not your puppet. <laughs> exactly, bro. Hey, Moons, how much you shoot a video for these days? Like 500? Yeah. See how the game's changed? I know, I know. Oh, and a surprise. A lot of people don't know. You know who was the girl dancing on top of the roof? At the rhodium yeah, in my video? I saw that. Daza. Was it really? Daza. I saw she was light skinned. I couldn't make it out because of the, the quality yeah. of the video. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it's, it's true. It, that video is a piece of garbage, bro. The, the company actually made him re edit it like five or six times, bro. So I got at home my VHS tapes, all five different edits. Yeah, yeah. Like, you it, shot it for, at the rhodium, swap me, right? We wanted, it, we wanted it at the rhodium because that's where it all started for us. So then. Who comes knocking at uh, uh, Disney's door? Two brothers, and we meet them, and they want to film our next video. We didn't know who they were or who they would become, but it was Albert and Alan Hughes. The Hughes, Hughes brothers. brothers. I was gonna say. I was gonna guess. Yeah, I was gonna, same ones who shot uh, boys. Well, not boys in the hood. It was uh, Menace to Society. Menace to Society. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. Yes, yes. And it's funny though because they shot that video. Man, that video was so fucking dope. That video was so dope. We shot it at Venice Beach. Uh, Sam Perkins from the Lakers. Was that was the there? Leave My Curl Alone? Uh, leave my curl I was alone. at that video. Yeah. Me and Bobby, rest in peace, man. We were there at Venice Beach. I and mean, we didn't get our, I think we, we were late. That's why we didn't get our cameo. But you guys were, I remember when we pulled up, you guys were in an Impala or something That's coming right. down the street. And that was almost at the end of the video shoot, too. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, but, me old Mexicans ain't always on time, I thought. <laughs> yeah, it's all good, you know. So and then, Quick was there. Easy, Easy E was there. Yeah, there was a lot, it's a lot, a lot of, lot of motherfuckers. There. Yeah, but it to me that was a dope video. And then it, we did uh, sitting in the park. Okay, there. so we we did the intro at um in South Central. We did a carjacking scene, and then we did portion of the video at uh Echo Park. Right. So, but yeah, man, those are good times. And then uh, it was funny because I often tell the story. I get a script in the mail. And I didn't know what the hell it was. And it was red. And I opened it up and he had a posty note. This is your line. And I and I said, hmm, okay. So I called up Alan and I said, hey, man, I got a script from you guys. Yeah, we want you to be in our movie, Menace of Society. We, we, we got a little part for you. Oh, dope. Yeah. So they had a part for Quick. They had a part for High C as well. Well, I didn't end up going. You just... Didn't want to go. You didn't feel like it. You, you, know, you know what it was, bro. You I'm were hungover. No, no. I, actually, let me say this, and this is a message to this younger generation. When you get invited to certain events, to certain things like that, you need to take full advantage. Yes. You have to take full advantage because I was foolish. I was working on some music, and I remember that day I had to be at three o'clock. And you know what I thought? Uh, that opportunity will come back around. It literally. Right. It'll come back. I've around. been there. And it never came back around, and they probably will never come back around. So, look, I could have been, even if it was just a five-second scene, I could have been a part of a legendary film. Because you don't know when you get there, who else is there? Yes. That may want to work with you. Exactly. That, that's, that's what it is. And, and I, even to this day, I struggle with that, Tony. I'm like, ah, you know me I'm chilling with the kids. I'm at the house. Yes. Somebody hits me, and I'm, you know, at least a good hour from L.A., and I'm like, man, am I going to make it all traffic? And you start thinking, you start putting all these roadblocks in front of you. It's yes. like, motherfucker, get your ass up. Get over there. Whether you think it's beneficial or not, there may be something there. Right. Or someone there yes. that you might run into. You never know unless you go. You never so know. Take that. Yeah, you know what? And then Steve had me tours, DJ tours, by myself. Uh, I, they want you to go to Germany for 10 days. Uh, I got something else for Australia, and I got something for Japan. 
And I was like, really? He goes, yeah, you're going to make this much. You're going to make this much. You're going to make this much. And they're going to pay for everything, food and everything. And you know what I said? I don't know if I want to go. How long is the flight? <laughs> and Robert, let me tell you something. I kicked myself in the ass because those opportunities never came back around and I never visited those places, bro. Yeah. I was 23 or 24 years old and I could have been traveling the world doing what I love. Right. But I was at home at 1200 making beats. Sure. You were comfortable. I was comfortable. Bro. I was the same way. I, you know, the, the thought of just getting on the fly and I, but I, I, I think I it was more, I wanted to explore. I wanted to see who was bumping my music. When we went to Japan, when we went to London, Australia, you're right, bro. Like, I'm glad I can say I've been there. I could tell my, my kids, you know, yeah, you know. daddy's been there. We're going to go here. And I'm shit, I had, you know, probably the best tail over there. <laughs> I'm just throwing that out there, you know what I mean? Australia, bro. Not in Japan. That was all D double T X, man. But uh, hey, Australia, they they have some freaks out there, man. Shout out to Guam too, as well, man. But yeah, yeah, man. overseas just be slapping different moons over there. Our moons, hey, we gone, bro. Japan is always welcoming, bro. Yeah, yeah but, bro. Um, so those opportunities never came back around, dude. And I, I regret them. Japan, Steve, to tell me, I'm gonna go with you because it'll be my first time going to Japan, and, and I was like. All right, Steve, we'll make it work. And then he was like, hey, we're getting closer. You want to do this? Nah. And he even got my passport and everything. I think I'm going to pass. Well, you guys had do- shows planned out? or DJ. They wanted me oh, to Oh, your DJ spin. game. My bad. My, oh, yeah. okay. Oh, they yeah. probably would have paid you. I know. I know, bro. Trill. I'm sure you know that. And we're talking about 10-day uh, uh, stays in every place. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he goes, dude, come on, let's go. And I was like, oh, next time. And before you know it, he signed a uh, proper dose, started working with them. And he was paying less attention to me because he knew I was. Yeah. I didn't really care to go, bro. What's your relationship with uh, with Proper Dose, Frank B? It's, it's always been good. As a matter of fact, um, I'll tell you. I'll tell you guys a story that a lot of people probably already know. Ernie G was a lot like me in the sense that, like, um, when it comes to working beats, we just zone in and okay, we got to get this record done. Right. If you were to tell me, uh, uh, Rob, I mean Tony, you know what? I want three tracks from you. This is the budget, and I, I really need them. You know. Okay, I'm going to lock myself up, honestly, and I'm going to knock it out. Right. That's how Ernie is as well. Crate digger, DJ, perfectionist. Did you guys share the studio over at Scanless yeah, yeah, in Alhambra? We, yeah, we did. And then Frank V, one thing that I learned about rappers, they don't take this craft, this culture, or what should I say, the these elements of rap, whether it's DJing, whether it's uh, um, MCing, as serious as we do, the producer. And I'll tell you why. They would come in. Is the beat read? Is the beat done? Yeah, uh, plug me in, spit out his lyrics and get leave. We're still in there tweaking shit. Hell nah, I, I always stay. That's how I learned how to produce. I was like you watching whoever it was learning how to DJ. I right. wanted to know what this did. When did I got in trouble for it because right. one day I was in the studio with Mugs and I was fucking with one of our remixes that he was doing for us oh, and shit. I ended up getting blamed for that because I was hitting mutes and this and that. You know what I'm saying? Because I like to right. hit mutes. Anyway, but... Nah. So, like, so Ern, I mean, Frank was, he, he just wasn't always there, bro. He was always fucking around. Yeah. Like goofing off. He thought everything was funny. Cool. You know, uh, have a fun time. Cool. Whatever. Let me just give you an example. One day it was me, High C, Steve, and Frank. I'm, I'm not sure exactly where Ernie was. We had a interview at Power 106, all of us. Mm. Okay. Our second album was getting ready to drop. Uh, uh, they were getting ready to drop some for uh, Frank. So Steve goes, let me just get all you guys in there. We're promoted. Yeah. We're going up the elevator. And uh, uh, Frank B is constantly hitting stop on, on the elevator. <laughs> Bobby used to do that shit all the time, bro. <laughs> bro. He would hit all the freaking like a little kid. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So yeah. you know what I'm talking about. So And then he hit it again and the fucking button fell out. So now we're just stuck. Oh, hell no. So we had to call the station. You know, Steve was the only one that, during that time with a cell phone. He goes, hey, we're stuck in the elevator. It took us about an hour to get us out, bro. No shit. And we missed the whole interview. No ventilate. And this was at the Power 106? Power 106. He thought he thought it was fucking hilarious. The whole time he was just laughing. Crazy. How? Well, where is Frank V these days? Missing in action, bro. No shit. N- nobody knows. Nobody knows. I got to give it to him, man. He's one of the dopest uh, yeah. artists. Uh, um Latinos, Chicanos, whatever you want to call it, you know what I'm saying? At, it, Latinos in rap, doing right. it, man, at that time. You know, you know. let me say this about him. If he would have just kept his head on straight, yeah, 
as far as this whole genre that people call Chicano rap, yeah. he would have been it, bro. Right. He would have been it. Uh, but he just didn't have his head on straight. There were just times where he was just fucking drunk in the studio. And I'm like, hey, man, you got to do your lyrics. I ain't doing shit. I'm going to go home. I got a girl waiting for me and take off. Yeah. I, it's just those missed opportunities, like we said. I mean, but the, it was already there. It presented up. So I heard, I, I never really met him, maybe on a couple occasions, Ernie G. Uh -huh. He wasn't really a partier there, right? I, I didn't no, I mean, hear that. He, he'd get, I mean, we, me and him gotten drunk before and, but he was more of a mellow, mellow guy, you know. Okay. Real quiet, uh, but he like now what he concentrates in is just pure engineering, All right. and he's pretty damn good at that. So okay, uh, um, he's doing a lot doing of it. yeah, he's doing a lot of stuff for a lot of Chicano rappers. I think he just did a song for that guy. Um, uh, what's his name? Prayers, who's married to Kat Von D. He has that okay. Cholo Goth shit. Yeah. And um, yeah, he engineered a one project for him, so he's doing good, man. I was about to have him back on to do the calls with the wizard. Yeah. You know, but. He had a session, so I was like, cool. But every time we talk, it's always music, and it's always like we pick up right where we left off. And, I, and I always ask him, well, where, where's Frank B? I don't know. <laughs> I would love to see where, I mean, him just pop up in. He used to work at my, come out this way to Riverside and, and, and you know, work out of my studio and whatnot with the homie tech. And did, did you hear that they got fired from Power 106? So, you know, it's funny you bring that up because I remember they were on the radio, and this is like my first time doing radio. This, like, maybe i don't know like a 96 or something like that 97 and, and i went up there and i actually filled in for them because either frank didn't show up or, or they got fired it was right around the time they got fired i remember and that's what it was and and the homies called me up they, they try to get all crazy i remember with me and like hey homie you know that that's our spot I'm like nah homie like that ain't your, you ain't there they, right. they're calling me right you know what i'm saying like but so you want to tell the story? Well, the story was this, and Ernie confirmed it. Steve had told me the whole story because Steve was upset. Steve loved those guys so much that he did everything for them, bro. Like, I think he even went above and beyond for them more than he actually went above and beyond for us, which it didn't matter because they didn't have a major record though, the way we, the way we did. Yeah. So one thing about uh, um, Frank, he was always showing up drunk to the radio station. Mm-hmm. Or getting drunk while he's live. Yeah. And he would turn it into a party place. And he invited a couple of girls. Took one girl in the office. I, I guess it was the, the, the main manager's manager of Power 106. I heard the story. Yeah. Fucked some girl in there. Left the condom and uh, uh, the, the 40 ounce there. <laughs> <laughs> At the station, fool. Yeah. Corporate building. Like, I don't. You got to watch it, bro. Cause. Yeah. And then Ernie, he shared that uh, on my podcast as well. And he goes, I didn't do shit. And they fired me too. And I was like. Yeah, Fuck. just doing dumb shit, man. Yeah. And, you know, we regret it later. Uh, maybe we don't. Some of us grow up, some of us don't, right? Right. <laughs> um, so fast forwarding to you talking about, I want to I talk about your, your podcast, bro. Like, uh, I, I know that you started out uh, with this um, Rhodium Radio documentary, um, yes. mixtape documentary. Yeah. And I first heard of it through your podcast. Um, when you started Rhodium Radio, what, four years ago? September 11th, uh, 2019. 2019. Yeah. Okay. And that was only strictly to promote this documentary, right? That's all. And from what I understand, you were just like, and we were just talking here before we got on air. It was like, man, we were just fucking around. We just said, you know what? Let's go on live. Let, let, let's promote this. And maybe you'll give us some numbers so we can, you know, push these documentary. Um, right. Is that yeah. the way it worked? What, what, what it was, it was like when I finished this documentary, you know, and, and I want to say this. Robert, because first and foremost, you inviting me here is a truly an honor and a privilege, and, and I'll tell you why. Because from 2002 to 2000, uh, uh, 2002, 2017, I was working in the uh, distribution center for Rouse in the city of Compton. For 15 years, I pressed mute on music. I didn't want nothing to do with music, so I was working. Steve Viano passes away with my own money. I went ahead and got together a crew, and I did a documentary honoring him so that his name would no longer uh, 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 be erased if we open West Coast hip hop history, okay? Nope. So people are telling me, you need to get on podcasts. Now, 2017, I never heard of such thing called a podcast. Right. It's all new to me. So I said, what is that? Well, people upload it to Spotify. What is that? I'm still bumping CDs, bro. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You know? So, well, let me show you. So they go on the phone, this is Spotify, or you go on your laptop. This is the podcast. People just talk, and you tell your story. So, excuse me, I, I get on Instagram, and um, I just start, I start seeing somebody, oh, I was just on somebody's podcast. 
So I go on that person they tagged, and I contact those people. The beginning of 2019, I started in September, so like for a couple of months, I was literally begging people, could you interview me? Could you interview me? A lot of people didn't know who I was. They didn't know my history. So I, I wrote out a bio, and I would email it to them or DM it to yeah. them. So they could know a little bit of my history. And a lot of them were still telling me no. And the people that were telling me yes were people that wanted to interview me live on Instagram on their phone. And I would go and meet a guy at a park. And he would set up his sign on a fucking tree. And he would, I'm right here with Tony A. And Tony A, tell us your story. On some like began rookies type shit. Yeah, bro. But anything to get it out because I didn't know sure. how to promote. Because I was still thinking, do I buy an ad in a magazine? Nobody fucking reading magazines no more. So what do I do now? Wow. So they were like, the podcasting, podcasting. And the documentary was already completed. It was already completed. Okay. But how do I promote it? Right, right. So I, I called up the radio stations, you know, a couple of guys that I still somewhat knew. Then you can get me in there. Bro, if we give you an interview, it's probably going to be maybe five to seven minutes. I don't care, bro. Well, they want $500. Fuck, man. Like 500 Shit. bucks. So I said, okay, now, nah, you know what? We're cool. So I kept, I must have did a total of about 60 podcasts, some over the phone, some on, uh, uh, on, on cell phones. You didn't think to go to, to elsewhere to like maybe get a loan from somebody to help you out with this? Or did you say, you know, I'm going to do this by myself? Were, well, you, were you pushing this by yourself? Well, at, at the time I was clueless. Uh, honestly, I, I didn't know. Cause I, so it was just like a cry for help, so to speak. That's like, all it was. That's okay. exactly what that yeah. was. So I was like, fuck, how do I get it out? So I called up Violet Brown and she said, well, why don't you start your own podcast? I could take you to a podcasting school. And I said, a podcasting school? So he goes, yeah. And I said, well, who is this person? So she told me. And I said, well, can I see her podcasting page? She didn't even have a 1,000 uh, uh, subscribers. Mm -hmm. So then I was like, well, how is she going to help me? And her shit isn't even popping. Mm -hmm. So I, I just told my team, look, why don't we just buy some fucking equipment? You know, I had a little bit of money. I was still working. And I said, why don't we just buy cameras and... We just go fucking live. Right. I had my YouTube page only so I could send links so that people can view my trailer for my uh, documentary. Right, right. I saw a few of them on there. So, so that's all I had that for. So finally, we said, okay, let us plan it two months beforehand. So I would call the people, hey, can you do me a favor and uh, can you post up this flyer on your story or your page and let them, you know, it'll, it'll say we're going live September 11, 2019. And um, that's how we did it. We stuck to that fucking day. I only had 238 subscribers. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Right. You just started. I just started. And then I started explaining my story. I'm doing this for Steve Yano on this documentary. Right, sure. And uh, I had my guest. And then I took breaks because during, during how I came up with the breaks, one of the guys said, man, I got to go take a piss. So I said, okay, well, I'll tell you what, we'll take a break then. So we said, we'll take a 10-minute break. We'll be back. He's going to go take a piss. <laughs> so, and bro and believe it or not shit like that is what made people organic laugh. yeah so and then i started opening up fucking beers and i started getting buzzed and i was like see here i wrote in radio we don't fucking dick ride the fucking artists but we shine light on them on their career we give them the fucking flowers and if you don't like this fucking podcast unsubscribe bitch yeah <laughs> you're pretty ruthless on that i've seen you tony i will say that man you know and and, and i'm gonna tell you why i did that i didn't think i was gonna be on i gave myself two months my, my, my guy that was running, he goes, no, let's give it six months. Fuck no, fuck them. Two months, bro. That's it. I'm releasing the documentary. I'm done. I'm going back to work. Right. Honestly. And um, so I remember when I first hit my first thousand subscriber and I was like, fuck, I'm going to go get a drink. So we went out and celebrated. It, it was weeks later, man, a hundred, another hundred, another hundred. And then within a month, 10 K subscribers. And I'll be honest with you. I, thought to myself, this shit's got to be broken. It can't be going that fast. Yeah. All I'm doing is talking shit, right. and people are subscribing. Now, did you have guests at this time? All, all guests. But here's what I did. My my idea for this was this. For an example, rest in peace, Night Owl. Okay. San Diego. I've been knowing Night Owl since 94. I called him up, and I said, hey, man, I want to bring you on. And he said, why is that? I go, because nobody talks about you. And I said, you deserve your flowers, bro. Mm. Nobody respected Night Owl after that incident with Spanky Loco and Spanky Loco slapped him. And Spanky Loco l 
uploaded that video to YouTube when YouTube first came out. Right. And right. that shit was viral. Right. And I said, I want to clear your name, bro, because you're a fucking good dude. And I said, I got mad love for you, homie. And you've never shared that story on what happened. I want you to come, man. I want to give you your flowers. And he was like, okay, okay. I hadn't seen Night Owl in, in so long. So mm -hmm. in, I believe it was 2020, early 2020 or late 2019 when he came. And I didn't know how how old he had grown. He he had a guy actually walking him in to the studio. Some guy was holding his arm. And now this is my friend, so it hurts me to see him like this. Mm. And he could barely see as well. He was fighting diabetes. Oh, wow. So he shared his story. Yeah. And that shit almost felt like it went viral, bro. So I started reaching out to people that I felt nobody cared about anymore. For an example, Robert, say that you disappeared for the last 15 years. Yeah. My idea would, get, uh, would be, I want to talk to Robert. Yeah. Where is he? Mm. You know, everybody used to bump his shit. This guy used to dance and perform and he- Kind of like where are they at where are they at now? Yeah. Kinda, sort of speak. Yeah. And then you tell me, you know, I don't want to do it. No, Robert, you're going to do it, bro. Mm. You know, if you're my friend, uh, I want to shine light because you're a pioneer. And that's pretty much what I was telling these guys. And they came, shared their story. And before you know it, I was just like, you know what? Now we have a platform where our people can shine light on our people. Right. We don't have nothing like that. Right. So I was encouraging other podcasts, you know, uh, um, start interviewing these guys, give these guys their flowers. And if you guys need subscribers or you guys need followers, I'll interview you too. So I brought in podcasters. And it is funny because the podcasters that I brought in, their subscribers really shot up. They unfollow me and stopped talking to me. No shit. After, after being on your platform. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they just kind of used you as a stepping stool then, so to speak. And, and, and you know what? And I didn't, I didn't mind. Honestly, I didn't mind. But one thing I will say, like I was telling you off camera, when you start a podcast, and this is for all your future podcasters, if you've gotten any hate so far, when your podcast starts taking off, times the hate by 10. People that by other podcasters or just by people in, in general? general, in general. But I will say this on on the, on the good side, the love is enormous compared to the hate. Right. The love is enormous because I can go somewhere now because of my podcast, and I still get embarrassed, and I'm humbled by a lot of pe these people's words. I run into people. Hey, man, you're that guy from the. They say, uh, 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 uh rodeo radio. You know, rodeo. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, uh, rodeo. You see, radio. Tony come out with a uh, PT, uh, exactly. cowboy hat too. <laughs> yeah, and or, or there's like, here's a, a funny one. I'm on my way with my son to go eat some sushi. Okay, and I'm cruising. Some girl pulls up, pink hair, in a nice car. Hey, hey, and I'm like, what the hell is that? Hey, pull over, pull. I'm like, what? The? And I told him, I said, you know where? He goes, no, I don't know where. Mm. So we come to a red light. I run on the window. I go, what's up? You're the guy from Freaky Tales. Oh, my God, we love you. <laughs> no shit. This, this is recent, right? Yes, yes, bro. But at least one time every day, I run into somebody that recognizes me. And I think that's a blessing. But I will say this, even though 99.9% per .9 of the hate comes through social media, right. Robert, I have never met a hater in person. No, of course not. They're made... That's why they're made, you know, to be right. behind their iPhones. You know, I, I've had other projects, uh, my, my family YouTube channel. I've had the lighter shade of brown, obviously. And you can imagine what I'm getting ever since Bobby passed away. Yes. I get all this. I, I see all that. But I just, I, I learned to embrace it all. You know what I'm saying? As you should. And I'm mm -hmm. sure you're probably getting better as well. It's like, fuck them. You know what I'm saying? Like, if they're going to take time to watch me. And I hear you, too. And I hear you when you say something about, like, uh... I, you always it's one of your favorite uh, famous phrases you always say something like uh, after you say slap the shit out of somebody because <laughs> that could piss some people off too but um but you always say something like uh hey you know fucking hate you shout out the haters right like, either, even though you, but you're still watching thank you so much whatever because whatever, it's true it, regardless man it helps the algorithm it right. helps everything else what you're doing and do they really hate you if they really are on right. your podcast every in, in the super chats every week and I, I'm glad you brought that up because one time this one guy told me, I fucking can't stand you. I, I, uh, what do you say? He goes, I've seen all your episodes. He's telling me that he's seen all my episodes. <laughs> I fucking can't stand you. Talk, you're talking about slap somebody. I had to slap you. <laughs> Fuck you. You know, you got, you, your podcast is trash. So you know what I did? That day I had time. I could have said, chinga tu madre culé. You know, yeah. But I just said, I just had one question, and he put what? And I said, why do you hate me so much? 
And here's what he said. Well, I was a big Tony A fan, and I've always wanted to meet you. And it's almost like the hate went away. He just wanted to talk to me. That was his way of reaching out to you. Yeah. I, I've come across a lot of those, too. And, and that, I'm glad you, you asked him that way because... And you got the reality of it. Yeah, you know? he, he was like, bro, I just want to meet you, man. And, you know, you say a lot of things. You give other people opportunity. I'm also a rapper, and I want to be on your show. You don't know what I would do. So one day we had a meet and greet for an artist that I was producing at the time, and that guy showed up. He showed up, and he came up to me. He goes, I was that guy you were talking to. No shit. Yeah, yeah. and I shook his hand. I gave him a hug, yeah. took a picture with him, and said, you want something to drink? Yeah. And after that, he came on my page praising me, yeah. you know, which cool. I, I don't mind that, but I wanted to know, what did I do to you? Yeah. You know? Well, I'm sure you come across a lot of those, uh, you know, disgruntled fans or trollers, however you want to call them. But at the end of the day, bro, we just can't really please everybody. Yes. And, and those that want to come on, again, you know, you're welcome to do that. But like you said earlier, you made a point. The love outshines yes. the hate all day. All day. So bro. we invite you. Like, you, And sometimes, trust me, I'll see one and I'll go, I'm about to answer like right away. Because it depends when you catch me. If I'm on a fucking bad day, you know what I'm saying? Like, my, my, Everybody, like something's not going right at home or, or just whatever. You know, a work thing happened and I'm just like, fuck. Yeah, I might I might respond back, and I've I've responded sometimes. I've deleted the shit too, right, you know what right. I mean? Because like, or I didn't even hit send sometimes because it's just right. like you know what, this ain't worth it. You ain't worth it. Absolutely, I should be paying attention to those that love on me. Right. So right. you know, and and I've had some because just like you, there's times when you have your days. Like one day I was working out, okay, and then this one guy kept trying to bang on me. He was literally talking shit about me in every single one of my pictures on my comments. Yeah. So I gave him the address to my gym. I said, I'll be here for about another hour if you want to roll through, bro. Like that. And then he was just like, well, I'm going to roll through. I said, and roll through, which brings Pull up. Here. <laughs> yeah, pull up. Nobody ever pulls up, bro. So, yeah. And, and, and let me say this. With all due respect, I'm not trying to start nothing, but I've done over, uh, tomorrow will be 277 interviews on Rodium Radio. Okay? Talk about it. Over 276 people have my address to my studio. Ask me how many people have ever pulled up. That's crazy if you think about it. I feel you on that, man. So, you know. I know your shit's been shot up because I saw that. Yes. Somewhere. I heard about that somewhere. Yeah. Whoever was shot couldn't shoot. Yeah. <laughs> so. Tony A, up in the building, man. Uh, let's talk about uh, Freaky Tales podcast because I know you've had Rodeo on radio for the Freaky Tales is fairly new, right? Yes, Freaky Tales, yes. Um, as a matter of fact, I'll tell you how many subscribers I have. And the reason why I'm sharing that is because. And that's with Marvelous Inc., correct? Yeah, he, he's recently become my co host. We have 14,200 subscribers. We had a. Ooh. That's about a, uh, a little bit over a year at the most. We started hyping it up on Rodeo Radio. If you guys like paranormal, if you guys like, you know, spooky ghost story type of shit. Yeah. That's all we're going to talk about, okay? We had over a thousand people subscribed and we had absolutely no content up, mm -hmm. okay? Um, we put up one video, which was an introduction video. We had already qualified for monetization. So the day that we actually went live, uh, uh, we were already monetized. Shit. That's okay. Dope. Yeah, and, and uh, you guys don't understand how hard it is to get monetized for starters. You got to have like YouTube wants a thousand uh, subscribers. Yeah. They want so many hours watched, yes. and you got to hit all these tiers. Yes, and and uh, um, so uh, I started off with my brother, and you know things didn't work out between. I don't even want to get into that. He left, so now I'm stuck with it. It was supposed to be me and him, you know. So I started inviting people, and little by little, I just kind of stopped doing it because it's hard to find people that experience paranormal. Right. So little by little, I've interviewed witches, or at least ladies that claim they're witches. Yeah. You know, and uh, they told me how to, well. Dated some too. Yeah. <laughs> those, are, those are bitches. <laughs> so anyways, so about six months ago, I met Marvelous, uh, Marvelous Inc., and I just said, hey, look, bro, we talk a lot about this stuff off air. Why don't you bring it on air and we'll do, you know. Yeah, you know. bring it to the platform. And he just said, fuck it, let's do it then. So, so we do it now. Now we probably average on, on that platform at least a thousand people every time we go live. Every time. Shit. On Rodium Radio, uh, uh, we average on a bad day. Let's just say I interview somebody that nobody's ever heard of. Right. 
still over a thousand people. That's dope. Do you yeah. do you fi- feel that your work has increased your workload? Yes, yes. But you you know what? One thing that I want people to respect is that when I bring in an artist that you've never heard, you always get certain people, not a lot, certain people. Who in the hell is that? Right. And I said, well, you know, at one point you could have said, who in the hell is that, and meant that about Snoop. You could at one point everybody was a nobody, bro. Mm-hmm. We don't know who these people are going to be. But I'm just trying to give them an opportunity. And I don't even have to like their music. Mm -hmm. They have somewhat of a following. They're trying to break into this industry. I wish that I had this kind of help when I was coming up. Right. I wish I had this kind of help when it came to podcasting. Yeah. But I had to do it all myself. Yeah. So... You know, I, and, and there's it's growing now. The podcasters, right? As yes. far as uh, Latino hosted, yes, bringing on yes. Uh, Latino guests, yes. And you know, there's a lot of a lot of them, and I I encourage you know our people to make these platforms, but make them where we can benefit from them. Because mm. I see a lot of people, the, all the artists getting drunk and telling either jail stories, like when I was in the pen, right, or they start disrespecting another podcast or another rapper. Yeah, and all you're showing is our people that there can never be unity. Right. You know, let's show unity, but be an example. You know what I notice about you? And I don't mean to cut you off, but I notice the interviewer you are. You don't really, you don't take it there. You don't push the envelope. Like if you already know somebody that's got beef, that's you're interviewing yes. with some of that somebody else. You don't ask because I know I can attest because you've asked me right. right before we get started, brother. Is there anything you don't want to talk about? If there's this, I know this is going on. I was going to ask you about, like, you'll, you'll, you'll at least ask me before you ask me live on air. Right. And I don't, and look at you, you, you your shit's still where it is today. So Yeah, thank you, man. That's dope, bro. And that's one thing, I won't do that because one thing that does flood a lot of us Latinos that are in the podcasting business is that there are people that want to bring the street politics to us. All right. You know? Oh, uh, you know what? There's so-and-so just got out and I need to address that fool. So I need to go on your platform and diss that motherfucker. And I'm like, nah. You've gotten calls like that? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And I'm like, nah, bro, we ain't doing that shit. Yeah. Now, if I was a fucking pushover, I'd probably interview you, but I'm not. You know? And I've had guys that have brought their fucking guns. I want to put their gun on the fucking table. And I said, check this out, tough guy. I said, look, bro, nobody's going to believe you're more than of a gangster with that gun on there. Mm-hmm. I said, you know, you need to take that shit down, bro. You know, all right, cool, whatever. And then they put it down. Yeah. At, at the end of the interview, they want to take pictures holding their gun. You're not going to do that here, bro. Yeah. You know, uh, there's there's rappers that want to portray themselves as, you know, extra gangster. Mm-hmm. You know, and I'm like, bro, you're here for music. Yeah. You know, but a lot this of- This is what you started it for yes, in the beginning. That, yes, yes. Or yeah, it's it, been going on and I grown mean, to other things. I yeah. see you doing the calls with- Yeah. And the cooking <laughs> and the rap. You know what I like, bro? I, how come you stop the freestyle? Okay, the rappers. You know what? I I, I didn't stop. Dope. I didn't. We we gonna do that. Just letting yes. you know. No, and we can bounce off each other. You know? It's all good. <laughs> you know what? Uh, he, here's my thing. I I look at Tony Vision, my the name of my channel, like a television station. So Tony Vision, the name is a station, and in Tony Vision, you get Rodian Radio, Dining with the Wizard, Drinking with the Wizard, Calls with the Wizard, <laughs> Verse for Verse. So that's that's what I want to do. Yeah. But it's only me. My team does everything, the, the flyers, the, 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 the behind the scenes stuff. Right. I'm the one that, with the creative ideas, but it's only one of me. And, and when I'm booking shit, then you got to backtrack like, fuck, this person just wants to be rescheduled. I got to get another person. Right. It's just so much on my plate. Moons, aren't we going through that same thing right now? Moons yeah, has been yeah. with me since day one. And like I, like I said, I want the block out. And it's crazy, bro, because every time I come with an idea... Tony's done it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, and it's like you can't rewrite the book. I mean, I'm sure there's others before you who have done the same scenario. We all grew up in hip hop. We all watched Rap City. Yes. We all watched Young TV raps. Yes. You know what I'm saying? We, everybody got an idea from somebody. But I just think it's dope how you've been consistent with it. And I'm glad that you've done it because that just opens the floodgates to, to more people doing it and, and yes. welcoming more. So to that extent to where maybe somebody goes on your show you know freestyles and says well maybe low-key they didn't like the way they got down or whatever well right. fuck i'm gonna make up for it on odm in the blackout pocket you know what i'm saying right and, and it gives them just it's like different radio stations right playing right. your music let me give you guys an example of like one person I, and i won't say this person's name but she's a female a young female came to me with her manager 
and they wanted to interview. Their first interview ever. Mm -hmm. She was underage. She actually brought her mother with her, which I truly, truly respect. Right. I gave her her interview and I said, hey, uh, can you bust a rap for us? And I caught her off guard. And she goes, you mean like just like a straight rap? And I was like, give me eight bars. Yeah. And she spit. Mm. She went over the audience on Rodian Radio, okay? She only had about 6,000 subscribers. I mean, I mean, followers on um, Instagram. Mm -hmm. About two months later, she was probably like at, at 24,000, then 50,000. Mm -hmm. And now she's about 100,000. Uh, uh, followers on Instagram. Her subscribers on YouTube passed up Rodian Radio. Was that because she started with you, you think? I think, first and foremost, when I put up a flyer, uh, uh, everybody was saying, who in the fuck is that? Right. You know, nobody knew who she was, but she had a dope, dope style, dope voice. Uh, her, her delivery was dope, but there, she, there was just something about her that just stood out. And I just think that my platform gave her not the talent, but the exposure that she needed. Was it Bella the Rapper? Bella the Rapper. Hey, that's my girl right there, dude. I saw her on your platform, and you had asked her. Um, I always give you shout-outs for this because, you know, I, I, I'm telling you, I watch your shit, bro, and I'm, I'm a fan. And Thank you me. always ask who your Mount Rushmore is. I love that. Yeah. Um, I did think I did that with, with Yeska Guete on, on, act, on the actor thing, your four actors. But anyway, Bella was there, and she, you had asked her who your, who you, what, what Latinos are, who your favorite Chicano rappers are, whatever, whatever. And she's all, you know, I'm really heavily into females, right? Rappers, like I study them because that's that's who I am. And you know, she's also, you know, I've been bumping a little of this. I think she said JV, and then and then she mentioned Teardrop. Yeah, you know, lighter shade of brown. I've been bumping lighter shade of brown. I was already a fan of Bella. Like right. I, I heard, I, she popped up on my YouTube. Just like she, I'm sure she probably did. Your, I'm like this girl's dope. She's like, she was raised right. She was yes. raised on '90s hip hop. You know, her daddy, you know, played that shit. And that's why music is timeless. Anyway, long story short, uh, I had a feeling that's who you were talking about, bro. Because she's 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 fucking one of them newer aged uh, rappers that are just fucking so seasoned. I remember when she first walked in because Erica. Much love, much respect to Erica from being. What up, Erica? Hey. <laughs> She walked in and I saw her and she was just so tiny. And I was like, wow. I said, you know, dynamite does come in small packages. Yeah. You know, and then uh, <laughs> it was so funny though, because I think the second time that I interviewed her, she started to experiencing the hate in the industry mm -hmm. and she kind of let it out a little bit. You know, a lot of times when I'm interviewing people where a lot of people get the side of me, I'm looking at the person face to face. Right. And uh, I've been able to a lot of people that either cried and the audience never saw it or they were about to cry. And she was sharing, you know, and, and I'm not, it's, it's out there because I interviewed her, but I don't like to tell people's business, but since it's public knowledge, yeah. she said, you know, I'd buy a lot of things for my friends. I even bought beds so they can come and chill with me and all my fucking friends backstab me Shit. because of what's happening now. Shit. You know, and, and I feel bad because here's somebody that's underage going through that shit already mentally right you know and i'm like fuck yeah i mean it, it, you take it from somebody who was 16 when i first started doing my rap and you know what's crazy this conversation came up not too long ago about what are your thoughts on like it's usually not just your friends but even where you come from now, i know you rap wilmington hard right you know what i'm saying have you ever experienced hate from your own city actually uh maybe for one guy <laughs> just one but, uh, honestly I, look, look, bro, here's the crazy thing that a lot of people still trip out, that I can still walk the streets of my neighborhood. Yeah. Like, I, I go to my door, see, by, by my house, there's a diner where I can go eat, there's a coffee shop, there's a tea shop, there's Domino's, there's Pollo Loco, there's Taco Bell, there's McDonald's over here, uh, there's a park. Uh, there's I, a taco tar truck, because I know me and Moose yes. hit it up. <laughs> the Danny. taco truck's fucking everywhere now. <laughs> so, I walk, and so... The, the neighborhood, man, 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 Tony A, I'm a big fan. That's what I get in my neighborhood. That's love. That's what I get. Uh, yesterday, I was eating uh, by myself at a Tom's Burgers. I was eating breakfast. Some dude looks at me, you know, he's all banged out. He looked at me, holy shit, homie. I've been wanting to meet you for the longest time. Right. Can we get a picture? All love. Uh, the hate is only 
on the internet. They claim they're from Wilmington. Yeah. And it's just this one guy talking shit. You're not from the hood. And you know, yeah. motherfucker, I live on L Street when all this, where all the shit pops off. Right, right. You know, because I, I say that to say this is that, you know, I, I started thinking, one of my homies told me, well, it depends what you give back to your hood. Yeah. If you give shit, you know, if you embrace your hood, your hood's going to embrace you. I'm not going to say that's that's incorrect at all. But then you, you look at situations like Nipsey. You yeah, know, who yeah. got shot in his own hood. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, who else? Uh, Young Dolph. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Got shot in his own hood. Yeah. Um, it's it's like, I, I, I don't know, man. I just think it's it's when it's, I'm not going to say when it's your time to go, it's your time to go, but haters are everywhere. They're, they're everywhere. But like I said, and, and, you know, maybe haters will come like from behind or try to cold cock you or something, bro. But Face to face, nobody has ever came up to me and told me I don't like you. Yeah, you know, and and when I go to like even the shops in my neighborhood, like I go to uh, let me give him a plug, Andy's Hip Hop. They, they make these shirts there. I go in there and the owner's like, "Holy shit, man! Hey, man, come out! I saw you sported that that Wilmington shirt that you bought here on the documentary. Let me give you one." Right, right, right. You know, so it, it's it's very hard. I, I I've just never gotten it. Plus, I got so many fucking homies there, bro. Yeah, like so many. I know everybody. Growing yeah, up, plus you, you OG. So th thank you, bro. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, so growing up, it was just I was always my crew ran from fifteen to maybe twenty five guys every single day, e right in front of my house every single day. So a lot of those guys still live there. Yeah. So they see me like, "What's up, homie? What's up?" If anything ever were, were to go down, all I got to do is call my boy around the corner. Hey, man, you know what? Yeah. Get over. I, I would. I would think that it would have happened a long time ago. Yeah. If shit was really gonna pop off, you know, right. and. Here again, I mean, be, your your time between the high C days and Scanless to to Rodeo Rodeo and Radio Pop, that was a big gap. I mean, right. you, I mean, you you were still on the hood, but it's right. not like you were in in the limelight. Right, right. You know and, what I mean. And I did give a lot of uh, um, interviews to a lot of women to uh, rappers, and and I'm still gonna uh, bring some in. The only thing is that many of them, and I say this respectfully because I don't have nothing against them, they want to bring the the whole gang element nah I, I can't do that bro i'm not promoting that right and they're like well you know i need to say where i'm from bro i know where you're from let's talk music yeah you know like you need all 20 of your homies to come and support it. shout them out yeah bro i had shout a, them out i had a guy bro that i clearly told him hey, like this it'll be you plus two yeah because ceiling is limited i'm gonna be interviewing somebody before you right no lie he brought 15 fucking dudes bro <sighs> and, and i told him like this you're gonna have to get rid of them bro because if somebody that drives by is active and sees you guys here. That, that true. That's true. I said, you need to get the hell out of here with that, bro. So he told half of them to go home. And I told the other guys are going to be waiting out here. They're not going to go in there, bro. Yeah. So those are a lot of some of the podcasting rules that us podcasters have to, you know, uh, uh, we have to set boundaries for a lot of our guests, bro. You, and then the thing is, and I'm glad we're talking this because we both can relate. We give them a platform and it's like. If I haven't interviewed you because you interview one, then the whole team wants to come, like other artists, and, and they get upset because, you know, hey, man, and I'm sure you've gotten this a lot. Hey, man, you in, you in, interviewed homeboy down the street, whatever, or from this barrio, you know, why yeah. can we not interviewing my homeboy, you know what I'm saying, or what yeah. we'll do? And it's like everybody, it's like you can't interview everyone. Can. And at the, at the end of the day, you can, but I will say this because I'm a hip-hop this is how I came in. Like I'm still competitive when it comes to that. So if I don't feel you like straight up, like if you're dope, if you're not as dope or, and this is what I used to think when I would produce too, as well. It's like, homie, you, you, I'm going to give you something to go off on, go home and do your homework. You know, I'm going to tell you, you know, nah, man, you, you need to work on this a little bit because right. I'm trying to educate you, but it's tough love. It is. Sort of speak. Don't get mad. Cause don't take it as a diss. Cause I won't allow you on my platform or I won't do beats for you. Right. It's just, I care about that much about this craft and what we've yes. put in for the 30 plus years yes. to, to, especially nowadays, just to let you walk in here. Right. And, and because you know, but I'll let nobody's on. Don't get me wrong. Right. But, but y you know, Bella the rapper, she's fucking dope as fuck, man. You yeah. know what I'm saying? And she's a female, not taking anything with a female, but that just l lets you know, if you dope, you dope and your music will, you know, speak for itself. Speak for itself. I've That's had it. dudes that, 
uh, like other experiences that will come in. They're like, hey, man, uh, you know what? Um, I want my boy to sit right next to me. Well, this is not your boy's interview, bro. It's just an interview to me and you. Have him submit his music, do it the right way, and we'll get back to him. Right. But right now, it's between me and you. Well, why can't he sit with me? Uh, dude, I've told dudes like this. Look, bro, if you don't want this anyway, you can just leave. <laughs> I know you have, dog. I've you, seen you. you. you I, I mean, you just... You just come off like that, but you got to at least you can say that you're honest and you're up front with it. Yes. Uh, or, uh, they got to respect you for that. Then there's people that, let's just say that there was a guy that I didn't like because he said something stupid on my fucking page. Um, the guy that I'm interviewing happens to bring that guy. And he shows up to my crib. And I'm like, the audacity with this motherfucker. Yeah. So I got up out of my chair and I said, hey, man, come here. I want to talk to you outside. So we go outside. And I said, you got to get the hell out of here, bro. I had to tell one guy that. And I go, you were talking shit on my page. If you got something to say, say it to me. Now you know where I live. I go, so you got something to say, say it to me. Now I ain't got nothing to say. You got to get the hell out of here. Yeah. So he goes, well, I came home, but then he's going to have to leave too. Yeah. So I went out there and I said, hey, bro, how did you bring this guy? Why did you bring this guy, bro? Oh, I didn't know this. I didn't know. I I'm sorry. I apologize. And he just told the guy, here's my keys. Take off. Come back and pick me up. Yeah. Those are things that, once again, podcasters may have to go through. Right. So please be careful and be ready to address it when you need to. Right. You know. I will say too, man. I mean, just. Bringing it to your home too. I mean that that's uh, that's it's kind of risky right there. Very risky, bro. And and again, if I had uh, an opportunity to leave, which at one time I did, you know, uh, and I was about to, and then things went sour between me and my partner, so we never left. Right. You know. So, but I heard the whole story with the with the equipment right. and, and everything else. Yeah. So, which brings me to this point: the Chicano rap documentary. I've heard recently, maybe I don't know. It's a bit well been a while since you're still going to do that of course it's already it's halfway done works. okay good yeah. good good i'm just giving the audience an update right. if they haven't heard right. since the last time you spoke no you know what and i know you were passionate about doing it yes and you know what's crazy bro when we take calls i welcome people to ask me but they nobody ever calls and asks me that question they'll just write it on a comment what's up with the documentary fool you know and i'm like Call me, bro. Nobody wants to call yeah. live. <laughs> I always say, if you got the balls, make the calls. Okay? Hey. <laughs> but they don't. So I would say we should be done editing by everything and filming by April of 2023. Can you give us anything about it? Who's involved? I'm going to talk to you after. Ah, I'm, I'm, I'm you. Come on. Look, 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 look. Let me tell you something, Rob. The reason why I don't and... and <sighs> People always say, every time you take a deep breath, it's going to be good. Um, um, let's go. Th th bro, there's a lot of... One thing that I've learned about podcasters out there... Yeah. There's some biting-ass motherfuckers out there, bro. Biting. Biting-ass motherfuckers, okay? There was a guy that I saw. He said, um, um, everybody, we're going to take a break, so make sure you call somebody, text somebody, you know, and uh, let them know that we'll be back. And Oh, I got you. Your whole spill. Uh, yeah, and I was yeah. like, that shit sounded familiar. Right. You know? So a, a lot of man, those who know, know. Right. So my thing is this, like, uh, for an example, I did one about verse for verse. For verse. This guy started doing a verse for verse, which it's, it's fine. I, I don't have a problem with that. Okay. But my thing is like, if I have a really good idea about something, All right. I'm going to keep it to myself until a time is fine. Respectfully. I respect that. So that's why I don't like, now off air, I could tell you. Yeah, sure. You know, I could tell you, but I will say this, and this is a clue. Okay. There's just not going to be one. Okay. There's just not going to be one. Not one documentary? Yeah. It's, it's going to be more than just one. I think I heard you say that. Yeah. Because you wanted it to be like a series. Because one thing when you shop, and, and I have one time experience with my first one, when I met with Netflix, when I met with Hulu, when I met with Amazon, Showtime, and HBO, they just didn't want one. What else you have? And sure. I didn't know what else to tell them. Because yeah. I, I was new to this industry, industry again. And I was like, well, I just have a three-hour documentary. Well, why don't you chop it up in three pieces and then come back? And I was like, why would I want to do that? Because I didn't know the way they thought. Right. Now that you know, and they've already, yeah, in hindsight, you're like, well, fuck it, let's do it. We're going to yeah, do it right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So that's where we're at, man. Hell so. yeah. All good, man. Tony A, man, brother, thank you for blessings. Where we at, Moons? See, we're like an hour and 40 minutes. Oh, Damn, shit. the longest podcast <laughs> ever. I don't go too long, bro, because I, I feel like you can get to the meat potatoes within an hour and a half. Right. Now, maybe when I start going live like you, which you told me to do, which we, if you want us to go live, let us know. We're building our platform. I'm, I'm as honest as it, I'm being transparent with you. And like I shared with Tony, Tony was just like, 
Fucking just go live. Go dude. live, bro. Just go live. Go go live, bro. And I'll help you promote it, bro. I'll let people know that Thank you're you, about man. to go live, bro. And you're going to get some knuckleheads, so you're going to need a moderator on the live chat because some people will, will start talking crap. But, you know, yeah. it's all fun and games. Let them, if it's joking around or whatever. Somebody will say like, oh, didn't Robert wear that hat last week? Yeah. You know, that, <laughs> <laughs> they say that about my wife on my other channel. That's crazy. She would like, she has her favorite jacket. And I'm like, so what, my fuck? Are you really tuned in? Like, hey. Exactly. When you start a go for you could cash at me. I'll go buy a brand new jacket. Exactly, bro. You know what I mean? Um, I don't worry about that shit, but I, I get what you're saying. What I'm really concerned about is there's no screen screen calling. You can you screen call when no. people call you because I got me a little. I, I I have a number. I haven't put it out there. We use it on the other channel, but you don't know who's calling on the other. No, end. and that's what I like about it. Yeah, I, I just will not accept a, a, a unknown caller. It'll say unknown caller. I yeah. just forward them because those guys are probably the type of guys you just want to call in and cuss out or something like that. Right, you'll cuss you out. But there's people uh, like I had one guy. Hey, you better, you better tell all these fucking podcasters talking to street politics that they got something coming. And then he just hung up, and I was like, why did you hang up, bro? Fuck, name them. Right. Why, and why would they call your platform, who's, like, not po political, you know? Maybe I, because we, we had, I don't know, we had a lot of people in the live chat. I don't and know. And then we're together. Yeah. Um. Shit, man. Well, again, Tony, thank, thanks for everything. Chicano Rap documentary, look out for that. Hopefully that drops in 2023, you said? 2023 for sure. Looking out for that as well. Go check out our Freaky Tales podcast with Marvelous Rhodium Radio. This dude, man, he opened up. He started a... a, a a giant, uh, how do I say, man, uh, you know, to the masses, man, his platform has just been and very helpful to our, not just our, our culture, but to everybody, man. And when you brought Rodian Radio, bro, you brought substance and you brought, you know, that recipe from the 80s that I know that I grew up in, I was loving, and now it's just traveled, you know, worldwide. So continue success, Tony A, man. Thank you for doing what you're doing. And I didn't mention it earlier, bro. You probably grew so rapidly because you are dope at what you do. And it, for somebody who's never done it before, I've done it for 23 years, bro, yes, this radio shit. But when I when I started watching you, bro, you got it. You Thank know what I'm saying? Man. If you can hold a conversation and you do it with confidence, bro, hey, man, that, that's really all, you know, that you – and you got the experience. So, man, my hat's off to you, bro. Thank you, my bro. Thank you. Greatly appreciate uh, you and your team here for inviting me. Like I said, I truly, truly appreciate it because at one point I was literally begging for any of you. So now to be invited – right and feel welcomed it's a beautiful thing man so i want to thank all your viewers and like i said and when this drops you know uh, uh let's, let's let's run up those numbers let's do it man he was here from the beginning y'all already know blockout podcast we're starting something here um hit him up at uh, underscore tony vision on instagram and then of course tony vision on youtube that's the channel right there um hit us up as well at the blockout podcast all social media shout out to my producer moons right there what up moons you good yeah we good bro all right man until the next one uh, we'll catch you guys. Peace, love. We out. Yay. Hell yeah. Thank you, my bro.